Hi, I'm Phil Atkin from NVIDIA. I'd like to welcome you to the first Kronos Group video podcast. Graphics processing units for handheld devices have become sufficiently powerful that the bottleneck for graphics performance is not the GPU, it's the CPU. So this podcast will focus on performance coding techniques to ensure that the CPU in your handheld graphics system runs as efficiently as possible, aiming to maximize 3D graphics performance for C++ applications coded using OpenGL ES 1.1. As of early 2007, handheld graphics platforms will typically not have a floating point unit, so floating point maths runs in emulation and is slow. This directly impacts manipulation of OpenGL ES matrices, so let's look at matrix management and strategies for maximizing performance. Some simple rules. First rule is, bypass the OpenGL matrix stack as it may be implemented in floating point arithmetic under the hood, leading directly to rule two. Roll your own matrix class, 20 minutes of coding for the dedicated performance fiend. Third rule is, use 16.16 fixed point arithmetic always as it is supported directly by OpenGL ES. Fourth rule is, eliminate scaling from your matrix class. It complicates inversion, so forcing all matrices to be unity scale saves us a whole bunch of compute cycles. And finally, separate the model and view matrices. You'll need them and their inverses individually for what comes later. Similarly, we'll bypass OpenGL ES lighting. Another 20 minutes of dedicated coding with a strong cup of coffee will yield a lighting class that outperforms all current OpenGL ES 1.1 solutions. This time we'll use 4.12 fixed point, which is more cache friendly and burns fewer CPU cycles than a full 16.16 implementation. This is an entry-level global illumination model, and it's actually a directional ambient light simulating the blue wash of the sky canopy onto the object from above, and the muddy brown reflection of the ground back onto the object from below. Moving out of the holodeck and into the real world, we'll turn on the sun, and can now see how even the parts of the object that are in shadow have discernible surface shape, courtesy of the directional ambient light. The sun is being modelled here as an infinitely distant light source, so only direction vectors are used in the vertex lighting calculations. No positions, and hence no ugly square roots per vertex. A big win. Here we appear to be lighting the three objects with three coloured local light sources, but in fact the same infinite lighting approximation is being used as before, by computing per frame a direction vector from each light source to the centroid of each object. Again, no square roots per vertex and a big saving of CPU cycles. Note what appears to be a fond lighting model on the torso and the car models is in fact a texture-based, fake specular lighting model using a spherical reflection map. Here is the reflection mapping seen in isolation. So we've covered efficient vertex-based lighting for rich ambient, directional, positional and specular lighting. Let's look at visibility determination now, specifically fast, fixed-point frustum culling. The simplest way to perform frustum culling is to take your complex geometric object and surround it with a much simpler geometric object which can then be cull tested. Here we're using a bounding sphere, but it's clear that spheres don't bound cars particularly tightly, so instead let's use a box. Bounding boxes are computationally more expensive than spheres, as eight corners need to be tested rather than just the centre of the sphere. So we will in fact use a two-pass algorithm where we first check the sphere against the six planes of the view frustum, then only check the box if the sphere test is inconclusive. But, as this animation makes clear, in this particular case the sphere test alone would have been sufficient. There are very few points in time where the sphere is on screen and the box is not. But we've implemented the two-pass version, so let's see it in action. Here 64 cars are bouncing around, and each is cull tested using only 16.16 .16 fixed point arithmetic. Should a car pass the cull test, only then is it lit and reflection mapped. Note that if the cull testing were in fact emitted, and all 64 cars were lit, reflection mapped, and then passed to OpenGL for rendering, this demo would fall far short of 30 frames per second on our phone hardware. Ok, here's where the fun really begins. No demo is complete without big explosions, so let's look at how to generate a convincing explosion on a handheld device. 
Firstly, we will need some raw material to build on, which in this case is a 256 by 256 resolution texture map containing 16 frames of an animated explosion. As we cycle through these 16 frames in slow motion, it looks pretty interesting, but note that with only 16 frames, the animation will be either very short or very jerky, neither of which is satisfactory. Also, each frame of the animation is constrained within the boundaries of its 64x64 64 64 resolution region of the larger texture, so the explosion will not expand convincingly. So as we play this version back at full speed, you can see how these two issues have been addressed. The duration of the explosion has been increased by reusing the final frame of the animation, and the explosion expands over time by scaling the textured polygon, and it fades, simulating dispersion, by modulating the polygon's alpha. So this is better, but no cigar as yet. The movement is smoother and quite convincing, but it's clear that this explosion is a simple two-dimensional event, whereas real explosions are volumetric affairs, formed from a roughly spherical ball of expanding hot gas that cools rapidly over time. So let's bring in the third dimension by stacking up multiple copies of this animated texture. Here's the stacked polygons. We're using just three layers, and it's clear as we enable alpha blending that these three layers are giving the initial burst of the explosion the roughly spherical shape that we need. Note that the effect is intended to be viewed billboarded. We're only showing these side views to illustrate the physical structure of the underlying geometry. We can add visual richness by rotating the three layers with respect to each other and can run the animations on each layer at different rates, which both helps to disguise the fact that the same texture is used on all three layers, and also increases the believability of the explosion. The outer layers cool to black and fade away more rapidly than the hot core. So let's look at what we've built at full speed. The explosion is expanding in three dimensions, so the nearest layer will rush towards us as it explodes, adding to the realism. Let's turn on billboarding, and here's the final effect. It looks pretty good, certainly much better than the simple 2D version, but it's hard to tell how effective it really is in the clinical world of the holodeck. So let's put this explosion out there, and run multiple instances simultaneously. And now we're done. We've gone from a simple directed ambient lighting demo to this in under 8 minutes. 64 spaceships are thrust and cold, lit, reflection mapped, and there are 32 concurrent volumetric explosions, and it's running at over 30 frames per second on our phone. And we achieved this by focusing on maximization of CPU performance, ensuring that the CPU is able to feed the 3D accelerator chip in the phone, which happens to be an NVIDIA handheld GPU, to its full potential. Okay, that's that. I do hope you've enjoyed this Kronos video podcast and that you've found it useful. I have been, and continue to be, Phil Atkin. This video was assembled on a Mac using some great software tools, thanks Steve, and was brought to you by NVIDIA, a worldwide leader in programmable graphics technologies. Thanks Jensen. And I'll see you next time. Bye.